Anyhow, happy Easter, everybody. I wanted to, uh, wanted to start out talking about the Apostles' Creed. That one line hits me so hard. He descended into hell. We don't, we don't really sit there and think about he descended into hell. What does that mean, he descended into hell? That's Jesus Christ. You know, you, you watch these cartoons, you know, when I was a kid, I saw Looney Tunes and Disney, and he had, you know, the devil horns and, you know, poking the guy off the rock ledge into the fire and the lava. And that's kind of your imagination of hell, but you have to realize, Jesus went to hell. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again. And where is he now? He's seated at the right hand of God. That's what I want to talk about today. Jesus, well, what does this mean? How can he... How can you be descending into hell and sitting at the right hand of God? What does that mean for us? What does that mean for us? So the title of my sermon today is called His New Life. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 8 through 10. Can someone bring me a water, please? I'm pampered today. Sorry, guys. Pray for all your predators fans out there. The, the Lord will be with you. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 8 through 10. When he, Jesus, ascended on high, he took many captives and gave gifts to his people. Now this expression, thank you. He ascended. What does it mean except that he also had descended into the lower parts of the earth? He who descended is himself. Also he who ascended far above all the heavens, so that he might fill all things. Jesus, he comes into the very depth of our life. I remember as a child one time, I was in preschool and I'd always like run outside and like they'd say it's nap time, go take a nap. And I'd, I'd get up and I'd hit my buddy and say, hey, let's get up. And we'd like go run around the school and one time I got lost in this dark room and it scared me so bad and I felt like, I'm completely alone. God, God is not in this room with me. And it scared me really bad. But somehow I was able to open the door. But I never forgot that. I, I had this feeling God is not with me in this place. Not that he wasn't with me. But it, it sure felt like he wasn't with me. And we can see clearly here. Jesus descends into hell. Well sometimes there's a hell in our life. We've all gone through hell. Some, we, we've all had something very hard we've gone through. You know, even our, even our makeup, you know, it's like we have parts of this that are more exterior, parts that are more interior. And in, in your very soul and your emotions, you know, you've got your surface emotions, hi, how are you doing? Everything good? Yes, I'd like some coffee, please. Hold the sugar, I like my coffee black, thank you. And then you've got, how could you dare say that to me? I will rip your head off next time you say that. You know, we all have different parts of our soul, and like Don was talking about the holidays, sometimes something can really trigger you. Someone will say something that will bring up a memory that really hurts. And next thing you know, it's like, what is this inside of me? What, what, what is this way deep down in here? And you might have a different term for it. Some people might call it, you know, it's like a hell inside. Some people might say it's a, it's a, it's a hidden place. You know, but whatever you want to call it, Jesus Christ is there. He has gone to that part of your heart. There is not a place where Christ has not been. In 1 Peter 3.19, it says that Jesus... Preach to those in captivity who were once disobedient during the time of Noah. I'm not going to explain what that means. Honest to God, I'm not even sure exactly what that means. I've heard a lot of people say different things. But I'm saying that to say, there is nobody, there's not one soul that goes unnoticed. There's not a, a, a child, there's not a, a, a person, there's not a certain place that, that goes unnoticed from the sight of God. God is in everything. He's everywhere. I just want to keep focusing on this phrase, he descended into hell. There's another place in scripture, it sounds very similar. It's in Psalms, I believe it's um, 139, uh, verses 7 and 8. It may not be, I didn't put the reference up here, but it says 7 and 8, so I'm, I'm pretty sure it's Psalm 139. And he's talking about, I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. See, we try to understand ourselves, and we want to present an image of ourselves that other people will understand and respect. But we can't even understand ourselves. David says, your thoughts toward me, they're so wonderful. You know, it's, it's, it's too much for me. 
I am fearfully and wonderfully made. You knew me. You formed me in my what? mother's wombs. In my mother's womb. And he also says, verse 7 and 8, Where can I go from your spirit? Or where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, behold, you are there. David, he did some pretty bad things in his life. He committed adultery. He committed murder. He numbered his men. He did a lot of really bad stuff. And yet he was a very good king. But something that David knew, he said, even if I make my bed in hell, you are there. You know, a lot of times today you hear these sermons, you know, and they sound good. They sound good, but it's like, man, if you do that, you're going to hell. You take a bottle of that, drink that bottle right there, boy. You drink that beer, burn in hell. Go ahead, drink it. You hear a lot, you've heard, I've heard sermons like that, I have. And the people mean well. I mean, they really believe what they say. Take a drink of that beer, take a puff of that whatever, you know, going straight to hell. You know, step on a ant, you know, stub your toe, say a word, going to hell. Go see PG-13 movie, going to hell. You know, everybody has some kind of you going to hell phrase. And, you know, who knows how much of that is right, how much of it's not. But, but we look at our characters in the Bible and it's like, man, if these guys would have died, you know, and some of the things they had done, they would have gone to hell according to all that. But we see God has mercy. God goes into the most hellish, disgusting parts of our own life. And when we see Jesus in his life, you know, we don't see a guy that's respectable. We don't see a king clothed with glory. We don't see a king wearing these nice, really incredible festival robes and this crown. He's not hanging around the beautiful people. Nobody understands Jesus. He's one of the most misunderstood men in history. The Pharisees, when they came to the place where Jesus was staying, it said there were so many people at, Je at, the, at the house. Jesus could not even eat a meal. And the Pharisees were saying, he's insane. The man's, the man's insane. He's lost his mind. He has a demon. Even his own disciples thought that Jesus was crazy. They went inside to uh, rescue him, it says. And see, a lot of people, when we follow Jesus, they're going to try to rescue us. They're going to say, who is this guy? What is this person doing with these people? You know, how often did Jesus get those comments? You know, a drunkard, a glutton, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. Jesus, he didn't care the people he was around. See, the people he was around a lot of times were the poor people. Because he said, blessed are the poor in spirit. Yours is the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of heaven belongs to the poor. Because he knew they were needy. Jesus always went to people that were open, that were needy the woman at the well, the adulteress, because it was very easy to see, hey, these people have a problem. They're coming to me for a solution. And someone said, well, your, your mother's outside, your father, your, your brothers, your sisters. And Jesus said, no, these are my, my, my brothers, my sisters, my mother. If you're claustrophobic, it'd be hard to be around Jesus Christ. I, w I wouldn't want to be in that scene. I would probably be in a, a different scene with Jesus. One that involved maybe the feeding and I was like carrying the basket or something. But to be in a house and be surrounded by people pushing against you, you know, it, it doesn't sound sane. It really doesn't sound sane. You know, to me, I can't say I'm claustrophobic, but I wouldn't want a bunch of sweaty people in a place like Israel where it's hot pushing against me for hours. He would do stuff like that. He would do stuff that, that didn't really make sense. But he had such a love for the people. He didn't mind the fires of hell. He didn't ma mind B.O. He didn't mind people not, not looking nice. He didn't mind people having diseases. He would go into the most disgusting parts of the earth, to the most disgusting people, and help them. The people that he would not go to were the Pharisees. Not that he wouldn't go to them, but they didn't want him around. Because they kept saying, you know, who, who is this guy? Man, this guy hangs out with, with prostitutes and drug addicts and, and tax collectors. Who is this guy? And so people had a very hard time with Jesus. And we look at him and we say, man, this is the king. This is the king, but he's so much different than us. You know, one thing that really blocks us from following Christ is a lot of times we're afraid to go down into the lower parts of our own earth. And I've preached on that before. I read earlier today and um, a few days ago in Jeremiah. Jeremiah is speaking and God is speaking through Jeremiah to Judah and to Israel. And God says this in chapter 3. I'm paraphrasing. 
God says, Israel has played the prostitute on every high hill, under every green tree. So I gave her a certificate of divorce. Judah, her sister, saw that she was not fearful. And Judah was even worse. And Judah came back to me. Judah returned to me, but in deceitfulness. Therefore, it's better for faithless Israel than it is for deceitful Judah. I thought, that is really interesting. He's saying he likes the guys that are out there sinning and, and being like, hey, I'm walking in sin better than the guys out there sinning and being like, hey, I, I, I kind of walk in sin, but, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's all done. I'm done. No more sin. I'm good. I'm good now. And I thought, that is incredible. He's saying it's better for those guys, Israel, that's faithless, acting like a prostitute, than it is for Judah, who is a prostitute but acts like they're not. And I thought, God, what, what was happening during this time period? What was happening in, in Judah during this time? And so I looked it up, and they were under the king Josiah, which is one of the greatest kings in the reign of Israel, or, or excuse me, Judah. It said Josiah was a king so great there was none like him that followed the Lord his God with all his heart, with all his soul, with all his mind, according to the law of Moses. And that last part is really important, according to the law of Moses. So when Josiah becomes king, I think it's the 18th year of his reign, they find the law, they banish the entire land, they banish all the idols, all the idolatry. They cleanse the entire land as much as they can do it. Maybe the, the, the Ju Judah, they had little itty bitty idols they put under their bed or something. But everything they could see, they cleanse it off. And you think, wow, what a revival, this is incredible. Israel's out there being a prostitute with all these idols. And, and again, it's not just talking about physically being a prostitute. This is it's being intimate with these false gods they've created. But Judah, it seems like everything's clean. They've cleaned up their act. You can't go around. You don't, you don't see any more idols. You don't see anything bad. You know, and I'm surely the, surely the people are saying, wow, what a move of God. This is wonderful. We've ended this. We, we've ended the actual. We've cleansed everything. We've come back to the Lord. What happens when Josiah dies? Everything's back to normal. Normal hedonism, normal sin. They go right back to the same idols. And, and God says to Josiah, because you've humbled yourself, I will not bring destruction in your days, but my anger is not going to be quenched and I will judge these people. And you think, that whole thing was fake? You mean, these people did all that and it was all just for a show? Now Josiah, his heart was pure. But see, it says he was great, the greatest according to the law of Moses, but he never had a relationship. He didn't have that deep, 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 deep relationship with the Lord. He was a very good man. And when he dies, Jeremiah laments. He gets very sad. He, uh, he, he writes about Josiah, what a great king he was, because he was a great king. But he did not have that personal, close relationship with the Lord like David did. At the end of Josiah's life, uh, the Pharaoh comes from Egypt and he says, I'm going through your land and I'm going to Assyria to attack. Stay out of my way. I'm speaking by the Lord. And scripture says, Josiah did not listen to the word of the Lord. So it was God speaking. And said, Josiah disguised himself. You know, he put on a mask and he went to war. And so the very guy he fought against was the very guy that was going to fight the guys they were about to fight against him. And so what happens? Josiah dies, and the Assyrians win the war. They come into Israel and take Israel captive and Judah captive. And you think, why did you get in that war? And you see in our life, in our own lives, a lot of times we get in this war about what we think is morally right and what we think is God's voice. We all have some kind of image. I mean, look what Josiah did. He, he had this wonderful image of, of, of Judah. The place was spick and span, man. It was no cobwebs, it was flawless, it looked great. And here comes this heathen king into his land. And you know, he's saying, you're not about to step in my land. Man, I've got all the idols down. I mean, these people are crazy. The, the Judah, these people, they are crazy. You know, the minute you step in here, 
You're gonna bring your, your booze and, and your people, and my people are gonna go crazy. So no, you stay out of this land. This is my land, don't come through. And so he protects his image, but in doing so, he loses his life, and then Israel, I mean, excuse me, Judah is taken over. It's important when we think about Christ, his death and his resurrection, to remember who he really is. There's an image of Jesus Christ, and a lot of people serve an image rather than the true Jesus. A lot of times people say, God, what's wrong with me? Why haven't I overcome this problem yet? Why am I still walking in this? Why do I still have this or that or this or that? I can't tell you how many times I've said that, how many times and how many people have said that to me. Well, it's probably because there's still an image in your life that you think is Jesus Christ that's not Jesus. You know, I've still struggled with that. You know, it, it, causes, it causes headaches. It's like, here's what I feel like Jesus is and wants me to do, yet here's what I hear him saying, and the two don't really go together. I know there's only one Jesus Christ, so one of these voices really is not Jesus Christ. But the problem is, you don't always know. Because you think you've got this idea of who Jesus is. He's supposed to be like this, like this, like this. And you've got this moral champion. And then you look at the Jesus in scriptures. And yes, he was a moral champion, but not in the way you'd expect. I mean, he was hanging out in, in, in places with people you would never expect. You know, being called a, a drunkard, a glutton. And so he didn't have that religious image. Jesus did not have a good image. In Isaiah it says... He was marred. He had no stately form that we should admire him, that we should desire him. That isn't just physically. It's emotionally. You know, people didn't look at Jesus and say, man, what a cool guy. Not when they saw his power, what he could do. They said, hey, let's make you king. But when the going got tough, most people got going because they said, wait, what is this guy doing? This guy is nuts. What, what is he saying? He's eating my body, drink my flesh? That is not cool. This guy's probably in a cult. This, this guy is definitely in a cult. This is weird, man. Yep, it's called Christianity. It's a cult he started. Thank God I'm part of it. I had a dream the other night about God coming into my own hell. And it's funny because I watched a string of Eddie Murphy movies. And he's got some really funny stuff out. One called Imagine That with his daughter. It's really cute. But in the dream... I've had several dreams about Eddie Murphy, and I've realized God speaks in the night. It says in Job 33, God speaks once, yet twice in the night, and yet no man notices. So I said, all right, I'm going to get up and start journaling now when you speak. And in my dream, Eddie Murphy represents a part of me, usually that's, that's uh, theatrical, creative, but also vengeful. And <laughs> this last dream I had, he was in a mall, and I remember he just kept watching this guy in the bank. And he said, I'm waiting for you to get out of the bank. I'm going to get you, man. I'm going to get you. And it was a beautiful mall with so many things to do. And yet his entire attention was focused on getting revenge on this one guy. And God spoke to me. He said, Josh, look at you. You're like that Eddie Murphy in the dream. You want the revenge. You're still trying to have revenge. There is something in your life you've been joined to. And it's not Jesus Christ. It's an image. And all the things that happened to you in your past, you want to prove to the world so bad that you're going to make it, that you're surviving, that you're strong enough. He said, that is not me. Look at how this motivates your life. And I don't see this every day. Like, you, if you told me that, I might not even believe you because I, I don't even recognize it. But when I see it visually like that, there's no excuse. I say, man, look how much energy I spend still trying to prove that what happened to me. It's like I can justify hey, this is better, I'm better, I'm okay now, I'm okay, look, I'm successful, look at this, look, I have money, I have success, look. It's like constantly trying to get revenge from stuff that happened in the past, you know, from not feeling significant, from feeling less than. And I thought, wow, all that for nothing, that is insane. It's interesting, since I've been journaling my dreams, it's like going deeper and deeper and deeper into the rabbit hole. My very first dream I had that was uh, very strong and prophetic was probably 25 years ago. I had a dream I was going to hell. And I was terrified because I, I was in a mall again and I went down this escalator and I saw these big double doors and it said hell. 
And I remember in the dream, just like you could almost feel the fire. It was like it was terrifying. And I thought, man, God, help, help, help. I didn't know I was going here, man. How did I get here? And the door is shut. And I realized, hey, look, God was with me in my own hell. I was going that direction. But God was there the whole time. And it's like I saw other people going in, but he wouldn't let me go in. I didn't want to go in, but he shot it because he was there with me. And next thing I know, I had like these uh, rockets on my shoes and he propulsed me up, which was like his grace getting me out of there. And I was in Hollywood and I remember some old friends from, from school and there was a fire. I was taking people out of the fire. And so, of course, the first person I see is Eddie Murphy. And I guess he must have always been one of my favorite actors. But, but I pull him out of the fire and he's like, oh, well, that's real nice. You know, you're just going to have to do it again because I'm angry. And I always thought, why in the world is Eddie Murphy telling me I'm going to have to pull him out of the fire again? And I thought about it yesterday. And the verse came to me, Proverbs, I think it's Proverbs 19, 19. It says, a hot-tempered man, if you save him, you'll only have to do it again. And I realize what that represents in my dream now. It's self-righteousness. And see... It talks about Levi and the blessings and the curses of Levi. I don't know if you guys have heard all of our teaching about the different thrones, but there's an aspect in our lives that each of the sons of Israel had. Levi being, who are you joined to? Remember in the Old Testament, Levi, his sister got raped. Well, him and Simeon were furious, and they said, you know, that, that's an insult to our family, so let's go get revenge. And they wiped out a lot of people. They killed a lot of people. And so Levi means joined. And God's been speaking to me, Josh, look what you've been joined to. You've been joined to the self-righteous team, and you have really thought that that is Jesus in your life. And that's why you still have this struggle. You know, I want to be like this, but I also want to be like this. And he spoke to me. He said, Josh, that, that is a driving force in your life. See, guys, that's why it's important to write down your dreams you know, God can speak to you in a different way. Maybe you draw, maybe you listen to music, but he speaks to me a lot through dreams. And we have things in our unconscious that we don't see that motivate us to do things we don't even understand. You know, sometimes you'll, you'll get mad, you'll, you'll, you'll stub your toe, or you'll, you know, the microwave won't heat up your coffee enough, and you get really mad. And you say, why am I so mad about something so little? Hey, bass was great today, man. Really good. Why am I so mad about something so little? Why, why do I have this anxiety in me? Why do I feel like I always have to prove something? Why is this here? And we know that feeling drives us, but we don't know why it drives us. And last night, I really started to see with more clarity why. I remember when I was in high school, uh, scripture says bad company corrupts good morals. And, you know, be careful that you don't learn from from the wicked. And I kind of took that the reverse way. It's like, hey, you know, if I can learn how some of these guys behave, maybe I can behave like them. And I had a friend that was very manipulative. I mean, very manipulative. I would watch him and his, his parents would say something. They'd say, I won't say the name, but they'd say, you need, you're home late today. You should have been home earlier. Mom, be quiet, Mom. You just be quiet. I didn't sleep last night. The, the milk was warm. And he just yelled at his mom so loud. And I thought, how does, how does he do this and get away with it? And he did it every time I went over to see him. You need to do your homework. Mom, I did my homework yesterday. I'm hungry. And he would just sit there and just yell. But he would do it to everybody. We go, we go to school and, you know, we'd be sitting on the bus. And he'd say, hey, that's my seat. And no dude, I was like, no, that's my seat, man. Hey, man, I'm not feeling good. Hey, man, what did you do yesterday? Hey, hey, you owe, you owe some laps. I, I saw you the other day. You didn't do your lap. I mean, he just gets so annoying. He just yell and whine. And, but it's like I saw it's like when he got mad, he could, he could get his way. And anytime anybody ever said, he'd just get mad and explode. And it's a self-righteous anger. You know, he, he would get so mad because it's like to him, he was always defending his life. This is my life, this is what I feel. And it made a lot of sense to me. 
And, and I just saw him, it's like he could stand up to, to most people, most anybody. He would just get really angry. It could be a big dude, and he'd just go, hey man, hey man, you give me those skittles, man. You give me those skittles right now. And everybody would just kind of go scout, and it's like, this guy is crazy, man, he's crazy. And he was crazy enough, because he, he, he thought he's probably not going to do anything, but it's like, what if this is that one time where, where he actually flips and like beats somebody over a bag of Skittles? And I learned from that. I did. You know, I learned, hey, if you can get mad enough, you can get, you can get your way a lot of times. And I, I remember a couple times, man, when you have your mom in the audience, you don't know if with the shit or not. But I got some bad situations. And I could tell, I was a fighter, I was a wrestler. And I got in situations sometimes where it looked like I was going to hurt, and I'd be outnumbered. But I could tap into this anger, and I would feel so powerful. And I always had this feeling, a couple of you may can understand it, I always had this feeling, it's like, I know up here my odds aren't good. I know up here, you know, five guys is going to be hard for me to beat up. But down here, I know I can, can tap into something so deep, I just go crazy. I just, I lose all consciousness of reality, and I just feel like, Man, I can beat these five guys up. I can do it. I can do it. I'm going to do it right now. And it becomes a confidence because, you know, it doesn't matter who pushes you. It doesn't matter how big the guy is. You just have this deep down belief. It's like, if I tap into that thing that's inside of me, I don't care who it is. This guy's going down. You know, I had to get in some fights. I was in rehab and got into fights, a Christian rehab. You know, I mean, those guys are getting sober and they're upset. And one day they wake up and they're mad at you for no reason. They hit you, you hit them back. And usually I was a nice guy that, you know, I'd hit you and then I'd just say, hey, let's make that the last time. And I wouldn't tell on you. But it could have got worse. But that's something I could, I was always, I was always confident. Hey, this guy hits me again. You know what? I can, I can tap into this fight and it's all right. It's all going to be over. You know, I'll hurt him. And I felt like God saying, Josh, don't you realize what that is? That's a self-righteous anger. You really believed that I didn't care about your life. You really believe, since life didn't go the way you wanted it to, that you had to get revenge. The only way you could redeem your dignity, the only way you could redeem your own identity was to get revenge and to walk in this state of chaos. Of, you know, I can flip out anytime. You know, if you go up here, I'll go up here. You know, if you beat me, I'm gonna hurt you really bad at least. And it was a confidence I had, you know? I've had to walk away from that and push it away, but it's always a little bit there, you know, even on a mission trip, I think, you know, if they ever get jumped one day, I mean, first I'm, I'm, I'm turning to God, but if, if they get really close, maybe I'll just have to freak out and start fighting. And God usually stops me. One time there was poor guy, <laughs> one time I got pretty bad, but the Lord saved me out of it. And he spoke to me in that still quiet voice. And he said, Josh, don't worry about these guys. I'm going to take care of it. And he did. And they all lived, but they never came back to community. <laughs> and God takes care of you. He really does. But God was saying, Josh, don't you realize this thing inside of you has got to go. That's a confidence you have. You have been intimate with this self-righteous part of you. And it's been such a fear. It's like, it, you know, what happens if I let, if I let this go? Because I think of of being young, being really creative, being in, in a school that's more business-minded, and, and just not being able to fit in, not being able to stick up for myself, and saying, God, where are you? Where are you? And God was there the whole time. You know, I was a real tender kid. I was a caring kid, you know, but I tried to be, I wanted to be like other people. You know, why am I not like this guy? Why am I not like that? I never said, what's wrong with them? I always said, what's wrong with me? What's wrong with me? And so it's like that, that, that thing came up in me. I'm going to prove myself to the world. I'm going to prove to the world that I'm something. Amen. Praise God. And there's no amen or praise God on that because Jesus Christ is not in that at all. He's saying, are you really, in these dreams, he's saying, Josh, are you really going to spend any more energy on this? And I've learned how to distance myself, but I've never really given it up. I didn't even know I was there. I thought I was gone. But, you know, the coffee's not there or something happens or the predator's loose. You know, I might come back up a little bit. Man, what is going on with the predators? Come on, guys. But the God's saying, Josh, don't you realize I am in that hell with you. You thought I was not there, but I was there the whole time. I was there the whole time. And we give up on God. We think, because I don't see him for that moment, 
maybe he wasn't there. And that's where I have to say, and we have to say, no, just because he wasn't in there in that moment, you didn't see him, doesn't mean he wasn't there. David says, if I make my bed in the depths of hell, there you are with me. There you are with me. And I want to talk some more. How do we find this new life in God? How do we find Jesus Christ? How do we find God in the lower parts of our own being? Isaiah 57, verse 15. See, unfortunately, I didn't understand it was okay to be different. I thought because everybody around me said they were Christian, this is how Christians were supposed to behave. I didn't see anyone passionate about God if one tried to be the same. You know, and it's like, it confused me. But when you look at Jesus' life, he was very unique. He wasn't like anybody else. He was always criticized, always misunderstood, and people always wanted to put him into their system. Well, we can make Jesus our political leader. We can make Jesus a great Pharisee. We can make Jesus this or that or the next season. We can make Jesus all kind of things. And see, on Easter, when Christ supposedly resurrected, people, they want to resurrect an image to God. And we have to realize, no, we serve a real God. We serve a real living person, a being that descended into hell, a being that lives in the heavens, a being that's there for us. And I was embarrassed of myself. I really was, because I thought, Man, I'm just not cool. I don't look cool. I want to look cool. I want to have an end. I want to do something. I have got to do something really big in order to oppress people. And so that's God in my life. God is going to help me do something really big. And once I do that thing, bam, the world will know that I'm not a loser. The world will know that all the things that happened to me were for a reason. Bam. That's what's, in, that's what's important in my life. And I think, man, what a waste of time. What a waste of time. Isaiah 57, 15. <clears throat> The high and lofty one who lives in eternity, the holy one says this, I live in the high and holy places with those whose spirits, excuse me, in holy places, with those whose spirits are contrite and humble. I restore the crushed spirit of the humble and revive the courage of those with repentant hearts. Jesus says, come to me, you who are weary and heavy laden, I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I am gentle and humble in heart, and you shall find rest for your souls. So he's saying, I live in the high and lofty places. I live in the heavens. But look, when he was here on the earth, he dwelt with the most humble people. And God, I feel like what Christ is saying to us today, he's in every single one of us. But he's in those humble places. He's not in those higher places. He's not, he's not in our accomplishments. He's not in, in when we can behave and say all the right things. You know, he may help us be proper. He may give us accomplishments. You know, but that's not where he dwells. He dwells in the low depths of our soul. He dwells in that very, very basic place of our being. That childlike part that says, God, Father, I want more of you. I really want to know you. I want you to abide with me. And it's hard to go down there. It's hard to stoop low enough to say, I need Jesus in those ridiculous parts of me. Just like Peter, we want to say, Lord, not me. Depart. Get out of my boat, Lord. Get away from me. You know, just, just like these, these people that Jesus came to, they, they were embarrassed. This lady was embarrassed she had five husbands. I mean, these women were prostitutes, a lot of them. And yet, Jesus made them feel so comfortable because they knew his nature. They knew that he cared about them. They didn't have to put on a mask. You know, the, mo the people that had a mask on, Jesus was far from them. But the ones with the mask on, the ones that say, God, I need help. He was always there for them. And in these lower parts of our life, our very instincts, our desires, our wants, our needs, if we'll just invite them in and, and, and say, I don't want to have to do something to receive God. I just want to invite them in. That's when we can suffer with him, but also be raised with him. In Laodicea, Jesus says, you think you're rich and have need of nothing, but you're poor and miserable and blind and naked. To suffer with Christ is to go down into those lower parts of you, to reopen some of those wounds and say, man, I thought I was good, I thought I was okay, I thought I was rich, I thought I looked nice, but deep inside, there's still some kind of pain in me, there's still some kind of dream I have that I never got fulfilled, and I've been fulfilling it through watching Seinfeld and eating chocolate. I've been fulfilling it through playing video games, I've been fulfilling it through you know, drinking, I've been fulfilling it through something. 
I have been comforting my soul through something, but deep inside, I am still hurting. He says, uh, Paul says, if we suffer with him, we'll also be glorified with him. He says, the one who has began to suffer has ceased living for himself in the flesh. Peter says that one. And Peter says, so speak and so act with the words of God and the grace that God gives. He's saying, if you're suffering, if you are allowing yourself to suffer, that means you're no longer putting these comforts. See, a lot of us, again, we want to find God in a place that's comfortable. We want to meet God in a place where we feel okay. We don't want to come to God blind and naked and miserable and poor. See, he knows that we're like that, but a lot of times we don't know we're like that. We try to dissociate from this part of our soul. It's like, man, what's going on here? Man, I've got the, man, what, is, what in the world is wrong with me? We try to dissociate. And Jesus is saying, no, I descended into hell, and on the third day I rose from the dead. If you will go down to those places with him and say, Jesus, I know you're in the darkest parts of my heart. I know you're in the most basic, most humble places. And when I say the lower parts, I'm not just saying crazy stuff. I'm not just saying everybody is angry and needs God to, to satisfy their anger. I'm also saying that part of it's like a child that just has desires, that just wants to play, that just wants to be loved. God wants to come into your, your most delicate place, into that most childlike part of your heart, and love you. He doesn't want you to, to build something. He doesn't want you to build this big bridge for him. He's, no, I'm already with you. I feel all in all. That's what I love in Ephesians. It says he descended into the lowest parts, rose into the highest parts, so he could feel all in all. Amen? Amen. He also wants to deal with our strong man. Turn with me to Mark 3.27. Mark 3.27. But no one can enter the strong man's house and plunder his property unless he first binds the strong man, and then he will plunder his house. So who is he talking about? Who is this thief? Can anybody guess? Anybody? Who's a thief? Jesus. Jesus is a thief. He's talking about, he's talking about binding the devil, and he's saying, you've got to destroy the strong man before he can go into the house. And see, a lot of us in our lives, we still have a strong man. That's the importance of being joined to Christ as your best friend. See, he wants relationship with us so bad. When we have a relationship with him on our very basic level, we don't have to be the strong man. That strong man, a lot of times, we're trying to protect everything. This is mine. God, no, you're not coming in here. This is my lampstand, God. You're not going to remove my lampstand. I see you in Revelation saying you're going to remove my lampstand out of this place. Nope. I'm keeping this lampstand. He comes like a thief. You would be surprised how many places in the New Testament Christ compares himself to a thief. It says the day of the Lord will come like a thief. I will come like a thief. He's saying, look, I'm going to knock and knock and knock, but eventually I'm going to come in the window. I'm going to break the door down. I will come like a thief. He's saying, don't have that strong man in your life. You don't need to have, surrender that strong man to me. And that has been something really hard, you know? Maybe my strong man today isn't so much physical as it is up here in my mind. I think, no, let me understand, let me think this out. Hmm, let me understand this before I do this. Let me think this out about five days before I can, before I can step out on the water. All right, God, let's think about this water. How about we wait till wintertime it freezes over, and then I'll go walk on it with you. Let me think this out. See, the strong man is really hard for us to get rid of sometimes. But God is saying, no, are you going to trust me? Are you going to give me the strong man? Are, are you still going to allow the strong man to rule in your life? Because if you got that strong man in your life, that's an open door for the devil. You know, the devil is nothing compared to God. But, but why have him around? Philippians 3, 7 through 11. Uh, Paul says, whatever things will gain to me, those things I have counted as lost for the sake of Christ. More than that, I count all those, all things to be lost in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, 
For whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them but rubbish, that I may gain Christ, and may be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own, derived from the law, but that which is the basis of faith in Christ, the righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings, being conformed to his death, in order that I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. Now Paul is one of the greatest people in Scripture to look at because he was so righteous. I mean, this guy said, I was considered blameless according to the law. See, nobody can keep the law perfectly because we all sin, but in the law you had sacrifices. And so according to the law, the man was blameless. But he's saying, look, I was circumcised. I was the Pharisee of the Pharisee. I was walking the walk, talking the talk. You know, I was, I was like the, 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 the Mac apostle. I was, I was the best. I was the top. You know, I was like that, that, that business guy that everybody wanted to be. I was perfect. I was the perfect apostle. You know, I'm, excuse me, not apostle, the perfect Pharisee. And, you know, he, he, he says now, but all those things, all the identity I had, all that, I consider it rubbish. I consider it dumb to know Jesus Christ, to know the righteousness that he has for me. When we look at ourselves, we have to look at the righteousness he's given us, not the righteousness that we've received for ourselves. You know, we all have that old way of looking at ourselves. I'm like this, I'm like this, I need to be like this before I come to the Lord's presence. And he's saying, no, I went into the depths of hell. Do you think your soul is as bad as where I've been? I mean, think about it. Jesus is not scared to touch sin. He's not scared of disease. He took all our sins in his body. He went into hell. He's seen, he's been through hell and back. He's seen some pretty nasty stuff. And that's one thing that amazes me about Jesus so much. He, he's this beautiful, magnificent, powerful being. And yet, he has been in the dirtiest places in the universe. I mean, he has been in the worst places. You can't name a place worse than hell that I can think of except for the lake of fire. But I don't understand all that stuff completely or the timeline. But he went to hell. And, and we're scared of him seeing what's inside of us. I mean, just imagine all the things that Christ has seen. And so on the sea star, I want to challenge you guys. Don't be afraid to let Jesus into those lower parts of you. Not only don't be afraid, say, God, come into this part of me. Let me have communion. Let me stop trying to do something. It's important that we're joined to him as a friend. A lot of us, we have these other drivers, these other factors in our life. They drive us and drive us and drive us. And we're always, it's like we're trying to construct a house. But really, it's like God's constructing the house for us. I want to close with another point. When I say close, I'm not closing like just right now. So just know that. But it's coming pretty soon. But uh, Genesis 21, I want to talk about Ishmael and Isaac. Ishmael and Isaac. I'm, in fact, I'm not going to read. I'm just going to paraphrase. But Ishmael's mother, Hagar, she knew God as a God that sees. It's interesting because Abraham has his promise, and it's an amazing promise. You know, the nations, from you, many nations will come forth. But here's Ishmael. And so Ishmael, the son of the product of uh, Abraham's own working, is, is next to Isaac, a supernatural son, born in old age. And the two children are going up together. The one represents the promise, and the one is under the law. And eventually, Abraham's wife Sarah says, No, kick the other one out. Kick Ishmael out. Well, Abraham's scared because he knows Ishmael could die. And they give him some food. They give Hagar some food, water, put him on their way, and they almost die. Hagar is sitting there watching her son and saying, God, don't let me see my son die. And God shows up and he says, no, I've already made a promise to your son. He's going to be a great man. I'm going to bless Ishmael. And that's one thing we forget. God blessed Ishmael. He had a promise for him. God did something great in his life. And we have to realize that Ishmael to us, that law cannot grow up with our spirit. You know, for a time being, we do need that law. For a time being, we need the law as a schoolmaster. For a time being, the promise in us can grow up with the law. Now again, our law may be legalistic, it may be a law like I had, I need to prove myself. This other driving force that we have in our life. And they're always confronting. See, these brothers, they get together when they're little kids, they get along well, but they start getting older, 
hey, it gets bad. And, you know, Sarah says, Ishmael has got to go. Well, Abraham's afraid to send them because he's afraid they're going to die on the journey. They would have died had it not been for God protecting them. But see, a lot of times we have, it may be a person in our life, you know, I just want to protect this person, I want to keep this person safe. If I leave this person, oh, what are they going to do? They're going to die, they're not going to be, look, they're probably going to be fine, you know. But you've got to put them in God's hands because God is the one who sees. And when, when Abraham can put Ishmael into God's hands, that is when God blesses Ishmael. God blessed Ishmael. And God also blessed Isaac. But Isaac represents our promise. And so we have our true calling from God here. You know, the place where we, our soul, and Jesus Christ are together. And then we have our false calling here. Or, or, or if you look internally, our Ishmael. It may be a law, it may be a mentality. And God's going to bless it for a while. But eventually, you got to let that thing go. Because the law cannot grow up with the Spirit. And as long as that Ishmael is in your life, it's constantly going to badger you. And so a lot of you may be saying, I, I, I don't understand. I don't understand. You know, why? 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 Why, why have I not come farther than this? Why, why am I still struggling with something in my life? God, why haven't you given me, you know, the strength to overcome this in my life? It's because you still haven't let his love overcome it. You're still trying to overcome it through your own law. And we all do that to an extent, but it's, it's time for us all to quit here pretty soon. In 1 Peter 1.20, it says, No prophecy of Scripture is given by one's own interpretation, but men moved by the Holy Spirit spoke and wrote as through God. We have to interpret Scripture through love. God's Spirit, God is love, and God is Spirit. So the Spirit that people were speaking out through was love. When we're looking at ourselves and we're trying to find God in these low places, we, we have to look at ourselves through love. It's a whole different way of looking at life. Look, a lot of us look in Scripture and we take one or two verses and we beat ourselves to death with it. I've done it. I know a lot of people in here who've done it. There's always that one or two verses. It's like, you know, if you get angry or, or whatever, a hot-tempered man is like, ah, oh, I'm the hot-tempered man. Doggone it. I'm doggone it. If your eye causes you to stumble, you know, if you blaspheme the Holy Spirit, I mean... You know, usually when people tell me the scriptures, it's usually two or three and everybody goes to the same one. And I had that a lot. You know, I was like, man, what am I going to do? Don't be anxious. Oh, when I see that I'm getting anxious, man, I, I, I just got to stop reading the Bible. And, and I'm not interpreting the scriptures through love. When, when you grow up in a family, you know, there's always that love there. You know, I was fortunate to have two parents growing up when I was a child and I felt safe. And, and I, you know, my mom didn't tell me about hell when I was three years old. Like, mom, it was hell. You know, you, you, your little kid mind would never be able to understand that. And, and that's how God is when we're coming into those deeper things. He's saying, you know, I want to nurture you on love. I, you have to understand what love is before you can understand these other things. And so, you guys, when you're finding Jesus Christ that has been crucified, when he's gone into those lower places, look, he is in every place of your life. No matter how ugly, no matter how stinky it looks, Jesus Christ is in that place. You don't have to do anything to prove anything to him, to anybody else. And that feeling that you have to prove to something, to him or to someone else, that's what has to go. Otherwise, you are never going to find Christ where he's been. It says, if we suffer with him, we'll also be glorified with him. Look, Christ was misunderstood. You're going to be misunderstood. But Paul says, the sufferings that we go through aren't even comparable to the glory he has. Look, to walk with Christ, there is so much love, there is so much joy. Man, when I had malaria, I thought about, this is it, I'm going with missions. But I thought, I can't say that. Because if I stop listening to God's voice, that's where my joy comes from. I have to have God's voice. I'm going to close here pretty soon. Uh, turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. First Corinthians chapter 15, 50 through 57. This is a long one, so if you guys want to get out of pillow, you can go ahead. Now I say this, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. 
So he's saying, look, you cannot do anything with your own hands to climb your way up to heaven. It doesn't matter what you do, what people think about you. It's not happening. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet. Interesting point here. The disciples, they're not waiting for death. They're waiting for Christ. You, never, you don't hear a lot of apostles saying, hey, man, man, I can't wait to die. Man, it's going to be great to see the Lord. No, they're saying, I can't wait till the Lord comes back. You know, because God would come back and visit these guys often during their lives. And, of course, they all had this expectation, maybe this will be the year that he comes. That was a while back. But these guys were visited by Christ personally in their lives. You have to remember that. At the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. For this perishable must put on the imperishable, and this mortal must put on immortality. But when the perishable will have put on the imperishable, and this mortal will have put on immortality, then will come about the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. So to wrap it up, God is our righteousness. There is nothing we have to do. If, we've, if you've accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior and asked Him into your hearts, there is nothing more you have to do to become a righteous person, a more righteous person. All you can do is receive what He's already done for you. And a lot of us have places in our lives where we say, I want to prove this, I want to do that. We have mentalities we've been joined to, and that's not good, and I can pray for us today. But the big thing is that righteousness, is that righteousness that brings us into the heavens. He loves us in our deepest, deepest, darkest place. You know, whether you consider it deep, dark, or, or you feel like you're just childish, and there's a place that's like, man, I'm just not mature. I just, I don't know what to do, I don't know what to do, I don't know what to do. Yeah, you don't know what to do, but he knows what to do. You know, it feels like these days, to get what I want, God just puts me through that fire, and it's like, Josh, I am not going to let you reach out and grab what you want. I'm going to show you how, how to do it through my strength. Let him speak as the words God speaks. Let him who acts as with, as with the grace God gives. But it's a whole different way of thinking. We have such, you know, a methodical way of thinking. And if it doesn't bring you peace, if it doesn't bring you love, you have got to get rid of it. You know, we have a great teaching here in this country, but I can't say it's perfect. I mean, of course it's not perfect. You don't see people walking in perfect peace. You don't see people walking in perfect love. So that means there's improvement. I had this, uh, these lyrics come into my mind. One morning I woke up and I heard these lyrics. I'm not gonna believe anything until I believe God's love. And I realize, you know, Paul says, all knowledge shall cease, but love will always be there. Knowledge pops up, but love edifies. God is love. And if you haven't received that love deep down into your heart, it's time to do it. He's in all of us. I believe everyone in here knows Jesus Christ. But sometimes we're not always in Him because we don't realize the gift that we've been given. So today, I want to challenge you guys to realize that gift you've been given. Jesus Christ dwells in the most chaotic, most childish, most strange part of your heart. And yet he's there. Just know that. Know that he's there. And when you will suffer with him, when you'll go down there and realize that he's there with you, suffering with you, you will experience the glory that he has for you. In the twinkling of an eye, the moment you unite with Christ, healing takes place. And what does Colossians say? We're seated at the right hand of God. Amen. Amen. Close your eyes.